Ladies and gentlemen, you probably expect me to open with a tragic, tear-jerking story. A young man far from home, bleeding to death on a foreign field. His anxious mother watching for the postman's heavy tread, the telegram and the tears. But tonight, Professor Charmley and I will advance a case based not on emotion, but on hard historical fact. We will leave the sensationalism and the sentimentality to our opponents. <laughs> what we will show very simply is that Britain's participation in the First World War was a terrible mistake. I'm not a pacifist, and I am a patriot. When Britain fights wars, I want us to win. But victory in the First World War came at, frankly, too high a cost. In human life, we lost more than 700,000 men. In broken bodies, no fewer than 41,000 British soldiers returned home without an arm or a leg. In shattered mines, some 65,000 men were given disability pensions for severe shell shock, and that is probably a gross understatement. And there were other deeper costs. We went from being the world's biggest creditors to one of its greatest debtors. Hobbled by inflation and unemployment, we lost forever our position as the world's greatest economic and financial superpower. And in the end, we lost the one thing that our young men were told they were fighting for, our empire. It is no wonder that by the 1930s, when we'd already lost Ireland and were about to lose India, so many people believed that the First World War had been for nothing. Professor Charmley and I are not here to lecture you about the morality of wars, or indeed to talk about who was responsible for this one. Our case is simply this, that once Austria, Serbia, Russia, Germany, and France had taken up arms, we in Britain should have stayed on the sidelines and let them fight it out. Our opponents will try to persuade you that all the suffering, all the sacrifice, was somehow worth it. They will paint a picture of a rapacious Germany stamping across the map of Europe, led by a militaristic madman. And they will claim that we in Britain were leading a moral crusade, fighting for freedom and democracy. Now, Max Hastings and Margaret Macmillan are two of our finest historians, and I admire them enormously. But in this case, I'm sad to say they are mistaken. <laughs> Let's start with the Germans. Now, we're going to hear a lot about the Germans tonight, but I urge you to see through the xenophobic cliches and to concentrate on the historical facts. Germany had only come into being in 1871. And we often see it as a kind of Victorian Sparta, all peaked helmets and bristling moustaches. But the reality was very different. Take the Kaiser, for example. He wasn't an absolute monarch, and he certainly wasn't a dictator. Yes, Queen Victoria's grandson was a braggart, and a bully. But as his most distinguished and up-to-date biographer, the Cambridge professor Christopher Clark, has shown beyond question the Kaiser never really wanted war. Wilhelm II always believed that the quarrel between Austria and Serbia would be a purely local affair. And when it looked as if the Russians would intervene, he tried to pull the Austrians back from the brink of all-out invasion. Wilhelm liked to moan and groan about his British and Russian cousins, but when he heard that Britain had declared war, he was devastated. To think that George and Nicky should have played me false, he famously said. If my grandmother had been alive, she would never have allowed it. <laughs> Our opponents will tell you that German militarism was a deadly threat, not just to Britain, but to European civilization. But you know what? In 1914, the German army boasted 761,000 men, well behind the French, 827,000, and the Russians, 1.4 million. Do you know how many wars Germany had fought by 1914? One, in southwest Africa. In the same period, Britain had fought in the Gold Coast, and in the Zulu War, and in Egypt, and in the Sudan, and in two Boer Wars, where we'd invented the concentration camp. So if an outside observer had been asked to pick out the battle-crazed imperialists, somehow I don't think he'd have picked the Germans. After all, the Kaiser's Germany had the biggest socialist party in Europe, its strongest trade unions 
and its most developed welfare state. In 1900, 22% of German men were entitled to vote, and in Britain, 18%. So it's a very strange claim that we were fighting for democracy against a country that was actually more democratic than we were. And when you look closely at our allies, the idea of the First World War as a moral crusade evaporates completely. First, there was France, proportionately the most militaristic country in Europe, bitter, brooding, itching for a rematch with the Germans after the debacle of 1870. Then Russia. Let's take a moment to ask ourselves, how on, how on earth could we have been fighting a crusade for freedom and democracy, shoulder to shoulder with Tsarist Russia, then one of the most violent, reactionary and repressive regimes on the planet. You know, Mr. Chairman, when British newspapers needed pictures to accompany their grossly embellished stories of German crimes in Belgium, they used photos of anti-Semitic pogroms carried out by the Russian government. That, I think, rather says it all. Then there was plucky little Serbia, a country that had launched two wars of conquest in the Balkans in 1912 and 1913, a country whose nationalist paramilitaries had raped and murdered their way across Albania and Macedonia, a country that had been sponsoring terrorist atrocities for years. <laughs> and finally, brave little Belgium, the country that had killed 10 million people in the Congo. <laughs> Is it really 10 minutes? It's a 11. 11. <laughs> I'll, uh, I shall wrap up. Mr. Chairman, in a few moments, Max and Margaret will paint you an elegant, entertaining, and alas, largely fictional portrait of an alternative Europe if we had stayed out and let the Germans win. Of course, we can't know exactly what would have happened if we had stayed on the sidelines, but we do know what would have happened, Mr. Chairman, when we went in. Ypres, Passchendaele, the Somme, the Russian Revolution, the rise of Stalin, Hitler, and the Holocaust. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what we got by going in. So I'll leave you with this simple question. Do you really think that any alternative could really have been worse? Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much indeed, um, Dominic. And now it's over to Sir Max Hastings, historian, journalist, former newspaper editor, author of 20 books. His latest is Catastrophe, Europe Goes to War, 1914. He's also writing and presenting a BBC Two documentary on the outbreak of war and will be a key figure in the centenary events in 2014. Please welcome Sir Max Hastings. Every great historical event becomes shrouded in myths and legends, and few more so than 1914, that summer whose sunlit moments, because there were plenty of rain too, um, mocked mankind by providing the setting for the outbreak of the first of the 20th century's huge calamities. Dominic has just advanced a case that there was no reason why the local difficulty on the continent need have had anything to do with us. He is among those who cherish what I suggest is a popular delusion, that the two global conflicts belong to different moral orders, that where 1939-45 for Britain was a good war, 1914-18 was a bad one, though John Charmley goes a long stride further, believing that we could have stayed out of both struggles. The British people have always had a vivid idea of what they think happened in World War II, until 1941, we defied the vast evil of Nazism alone, and then we defeated Hitler with a touch of help from the Red Army and the United States. <laughs> um, the struggle was nothing like as bloody as its predecessor, so people kid themselves, uh, because we had better generals who understood that our soldiers shouldn't be allowed to become futile sacrifices. But our ideas about the First World War are thoroughly confused. Some of those involved... Uh, in organizing this year's commemoration of 1914-18, seem eager to make discussion of the cause for which the struggle was fought as vague as possible, to make the theme of this year regret and even apology. Tonight, Margaret and I are going to suggest to you a different view, 
that while the war was assuredly a colossal tragedy, it's a huge mistake to confuse depiction of its horrors, as Dominic has just done, uh, with argument about why it was necessary to fight. We believe that there was a cause at stake, that Britain couldn't plausibly have remained neutral while Germany secured hegemony over the continent. Neil Ferguson has written in perfect seriousness, and perhaps Dominic agrees with him, that a German victory would simply have created something like the European Union half a century earlier. <laughs> that we, the British, could have remained rich and unbloodied bystanders. To some of us, this sounds not very sensationalist, but frivolous. More serious historians, including some of the best German ones, see the 1914 Kaiserreich as a militarized autocracy whose victory would have been a disaster. Dominic's absolutely correct that in 1914 Germany had the largest socialist party in Europe. But Germany's tragedy was that that socialist party, which was devoutly anti-militaristic, had no power whatsoever over the vital issues of war and peace, which were entirely decided by the Kaiser, his nominated chancellor, and his nominated generals. Though it's quite mistaken to equate Wilhelm's Germany with that of Hitler, we submit that Western civilization has almost as much reason to be grateful that the Allies prevailed in 1918 as in 1945, despite the appalling cost, and even if the outcome of the first clash proved to have a tragic impermanence, because Germany had to be fought all over again a generation later. And although Berlin, in my view, bore a heavy responsibility for the Continental War in 1914, our debate tonight is not about that. It addresses the narrower and separate, although of course related, issue of whether Britain could credibly have stayed out once a continental struggle became ordained. Throughout the so-called July crisis, much of the Liberal Party and indeed most of the British people opposed involvement in Europe's looming war. They had no sympathy for either Serbia or Russia. Some indeed had a real fellow feeling towards Germany and its culture. In July, old Lady Londersborough, the first Duke of Wellington's great niece, told Osbert Sitwell in a fashion that mirrored widespread sentiment, it's not the Germans but the French that I'm frightened of. But then, suddenly, Germany blundered. Its war plan demanded an assault on France through Belgium, of whose neutrality Britain was a guarantor. Berlin formally notified London of its intention to invade. In 1914, Moltke, Germany's chief of staff was so sure that Britain was going to come into the war anyway that he decided that marching through neutral Belgium would change nothing. He could not have been more wrong. That decision caused the British government to send an ultimatum to Germany, committing the country to fight unless the invaders drew back, as of course they did not. It's sometimes said that Belgian neutrality was just a pretext rather than a real reason for Britain joining the conflict. I don't agree. Although Asquith, Gray, Churchill... Haldane wanted to back France to preserve the European balance of power. Much of their own Liberal Party was vehemently opposed until the Germans invaded Belgium, an action that united the British people as nothing else could have done. On the 4th of August, Britain became the last major European power to enter the struggle. A few historians argue that this country could have stayed neutral in 1914 while Germany secured its almost inevitable victory on the continent and that we could have prospered mightily by doing so. But the dominating instincts of Germany's leadership, repeatedly articulated by the Kaiser and his generals, would hardly have been moderated by triumph in 1914. They didn't go to war with a grand plan for world domination, but soon after war had broken out, they identified massive territorial rewards as their price for granting an armistice to the Allies. Had the Kaiserreich vanquished its only important continental rivals, it seems fantastic to imagine that its rulers would afterwards have offered a generous accommodation to a neutral Great Britain or acquiesced in a global status quo still dominated by British financial interests. Anybody who doubts the earnest of Germany's commitment to impose a draconian peace should consider the March 1918 Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, which Berlin imposed on the defeated Russians. To believe that Britain could and should have acquiesced in a German triumph in 1914 requires one to believe in the moderation and the generosity of Germany's rulers, as some of us cannot. George Orwell wrote, with his accustomed insight, 
um, a generation later, in 1945, the only way to end a war quickly is to lose it. It seems time, and more than time, to acknowledge that Britain played a necessary part in the Great War. Our participation was rewarded by only a few worthless new colonies together with financial ruin. But 1914 Germany, as ruled by the Kaiser and his generals and ministers, represented a malign force whose triumph had to be frustrated. The supreme irony of 1914 is that so great was Germany's economic and industrial achievement at that period, it had so far overtaken Russia and France and, uh, and Britain, that I believe that if war had not come, nothing could have prevented Germany from dominating Europe within a generation by entirely peaceful means. But it's no good to me dismissing the Kaiser and his generals as somehow comic opera figures um, who we shouldn't take seriously. In the last resort, for better or for worse, the Kaiser was in charge of Germany. The Kaiser was the man who ruled this country. The Kaiser was the man who signed the order for Germany to go to war. And I do not believe that Britain could have stood by and watched while this took place. More than 700,000 British servicemen who perished between 1914 and 18 didn't die for nothing. Um, all deaths in all wars are just cause for lamentation. But whatever the shortcomings of the peace made by the Allies at Versailles, if Germany had been dictating the terms, there could have been no return to honey for tea at Grantchester or indeed across the British Empire. I believe that we had to fight. Thank you very much. <laughs>